Welcome to Web Handling. My name is Dave Roysom. I am super excited to share some important web troubleshooting techniques that I've learned in the some 1,000 plants I've worked in. The key point will be that a back to basics approach is likely to do better than time based data mining, at least for the most common problems. Examples we will cover include very common defects, such as corrugations, path troubles, telescoping, and wrinkling. I know your time is precious, so let's get started. One of the most common observations that my clients share with me is usually one of the least useful. That is, some variation of we don't always have that problem. Of course not. I knew that already. If you always had the problem, you'd be out of business. If you never had the problem, we would not be talking. Therefore, all problems that you and I work on will be come and go, or intermittent as a function of time, as the title of this paper suggests. However, let us begin by explaining why time-based analysis of process data or lot-based analysis of internal rejects or customer complaints seldom works well and then we will proceed to more effective alternatives. Let us begin with a plot of actual severity, if such could even be measured, as a function of roll number or time. The first thing to notice is that actual severity is seldom zero or even low. Rather, it varies just like any other variable. In other words, in problem-solving terms, I call this systemic. In other words, you've had the potential for that problem since day one. Already, we run into severe analysis challenges. The first challenge is that actual severity is a theoretical construct. What we most often do is measure some proxy that someone believes will track closely with some aspect of quality that the customer might object to. Common examples include basis weight, caliper, and strength. Alternatively, we might track customer complaints, usually by counting the number of rolls or claim dollars. Usually rolls are returned, but are less often autopsied. Often all we know is that the customer is not happy about something, and occasionally their words for their woes. The thing to note is that customer complaints and claims and returns and dissatisfaction are not precisely the same. However, it is even worse. If we dig a little deeper, we will find that severity measurements are almost never ever made for the most common web and roll defects, such as corrugations, path problems, telescoping, and wrinkling. Rather, at best, we have is an analog visual grading with three to five bins, and at worst, the binary go, no go of customer claims. We will detail how to troubleshoot and remedy these four specific problems shortly without measuring much of anything, though the technique is applicable to most common defects. Now, 
Let us return to the previous severity graph and add a new element. That is, an observer's visual assessment of severity. The specific observer shown here in green is very consistent, uh, but a bit liberal. Perhaps she is a very experienced QA inspector who biases rejection cutoff to consumer risk. The green band represents a two sigma variation in the observer's upper limit cutoff, which can be sometimes determined by round robin type statistical analysis. The green line is the actual observer's upper cutoff limit as it varies from moment to moment, or in this case, roll to roll. In any case, the takeaway here is that observer 1 rejects 13 of the 100 rolls. Now, let us compare with the second observer shown in the orange band. The band is his two sigma cutoff and the orange line is his specific moment to moment or roll to roll threshold of pain. This observer might be a customer who biases their rejection cutoff to producer risk, hoping that someone else will troubleshoot and solve their problems for them. Their response might be less consistent because he is less experienced, or perhaps just because he lumps all sorts of complaints into a single fuzzy complaint bin. In any case, observer 2 returns a whole lot more. 35 of the 100 rolls go back to the supplier. Now, let us explore variation with a different lens. That is, which data sets will you be analyzing? There is the raw material lots that vary on their own schedule. Then there is the process data that varies on its own schedule. Then there is the role-based data, such as coming from the test lab, that comes in at a third schedule, typically at intervals representing the start of a shift, the top of a parent role, or the top of the finished role. Finally, we have the customer's data set, which is delayed by transport and work in progress times. These topics are covered in great detail in my Web 401.21 series. In any case, our assignment is to figure out which specific role out of hundreds will the customer complain about using one or more of these data sets. I think by now you are thinking that our measurements are not always closely related to customer satisfaction. Furthermore, we don't even know which database to mine. There are at least four, and all would be quite imperfect, either suffering from a inappropriate proxy or by being very inconsistent grading by the dozens of individuals that might assess the quality of your roles. Uh, further, there's the risk of the very real risk of p-hacking, which I cover in one of my other problem-solving clips when you do data mining. And you would be quite right to think that this approach is likely to be pretty hopeless. In fact, predicting which single role will fail at the customer is like trying to predict the precise time and place of the next 7.5 or greater magnitude earthquake. Thousands of things change, and far less than hundreds, perhaps even less than 10, are actually measured much, much easier is to list the risk factors for earthquakes because there are only two big ones. They are proximity to a known 
fault line and time since the last notable quake. We are going to use this much, much more tractable and much, much more practical approach for common web problems. The good news is that troubleshooting most common role in web defects is much, much, much easier than you might think. It begins by the observation that you are very, very, very unlikely to have invented an entirely new defect. Instead, your common defects are likely have been seen and worked on by thousands or even tens of thousands of people. Better yet, some of those people are experts and they have sometimes shared their experience and knowledge in the literature. More than 500 man years of expert experience on hundreds of common defects is given in the Ultimate Role in Web Defect Troubleshooting Guide. This is a veritable encyclopedia of defects, listing causes and cures and further information. More than 100 man years of collective expert experience is shared in the Web Handling Handbook. And more than 40 man years of expert experience is shared in my award-winning and trademark Web 101 class that has been taken by 5,000 students. And wait, there is much, much more. Much of it free. I have shared with you my Roysum Library database search tool that lets you look for keywords amongst the more than 4,000 web handling related publications. Similarly, I have my Web 201 search tool that looks for keywords amongst my more than 400 YouTube clips on my all web handling channel of YouTube. Special note for this topic is my Dave's Defect series. Then there are magazines carrying notable web handling content, as well as a book on web handling industrial problem solving. So, instead of reinventing the wheel, why not get back to basics and buy a book or go to school or at least look it up on YouTube? In the next two slides, I will show you two pieces of data that are usually far more important than time. Then we will detail the four example problems. For most web defects, the CD location with respect to the web maker or web converting element is most important of secondary importance is the width of the lane. These two things define the shape of the root cause of the offending element in manufacturing, which is your job to find. Time or roll number is also important, but only of tertiary importance in most cases. For most wound roll defects, location is also of primary importance. Here we would note the CD location given in the previous slide if there were any hint whatsoever of less than perfect web profile. However, now we add another location and that is the location with respect to the distance from the core. This is because most winding defects favor either the top or the bottom of the roll. If you couple that with the observation that most winding defects are tight or loose defects, you will be well situated to optimize the tension, nip, and torque settings and the curves on your winder. Now, 
let us apply our new troubleshooting techniques to a very, very common wound roll defect, the corrugation. Here, trying to predict beforehand which roll among thousands will fail to satisfy the customer using process and test lab data would be daunting at best. The good news is that we have a hundred publications mentioning this common defect. There, the consensus is simple. Step one is to reduce the winding nip as much as the winding machine and roll will allow. After that, to go any further, you will have to level the web's thickness profile better, especially by filling in the narrow low spots. Web path upsets are also common. They manifest in a widely varying set of troubles, including lost trim, poor roll edges, and printer color-to-color -color misregistration, and many, many more. Here, we don't even try and figure out which roll will be trouble. Rather, we figure out which roll-er moved the web the most. First, we study the sideways movement with respect to position down through the machine. Common subcases are roller troubles such as common misalignment and web troubles such as baggy edges and splices. Second, we extend analysis to why that movement varies with time. We have a whole chapter in the Web Handling Handbook on how to diagnose and correct web path problems. Wondro telescoping is also a very, very common defect. Again, we will not try and predict which specific role among thousands will fail. Rather, we ask why any role would fail. The very first step here is to recognize that a telescope is not a telescope is not a telescope. Rather, this word is a loose collection of totally, totally different defects that merely share the same outcome, that the roll edge is not straight. How the roll edge got that way is totally, totally different depending on which specific of the half dozen or so subcases you have. Some telescopes are taper defects, some are loose defects, and other telescopes are tight defects. Thus, you would have to know which specific type you have before you could even begin to know what to do on the winder. Then, if winder solutions were not enough, the second step would be to redesign the product and process. The very good news here is that people have worked this out for you and teach the subject to telescoping. Once you see how this works, diagnosis and treatment options are trivial. Data mining is neither needed nor useful for this problem. Wrinkling is probably the number one cause of waste and delay and customer complaint in the web industries. Thus, we should all be proficient in diagnosis. Again, we will not need to collect data from raw material, machine, test lab, or customer. Again, we will not try and predict which specific role will fail. Instead, we will ask why any role will fail. Again, no need to reinvent the wheel. Again, a wrinkle is not a wrinkle is not a wrinkle. The word wrinkle is used for a wide collection of totally, totally different defects, each with their own separate causes and cures. The very good news here is that people have already worked this out for you. The very first step is to diagnose which of the 20 or so subtypes you have at any one time 
at any one place. The very good news here is that we have a simple free internet to help you through this. It is so simple that even an operator can use this. For the more advanced troubleshooter, we have a whole chapter on wrinkling in the Web Handling Handbook, and there are more than 200 publications on the subject. Trying to predict which role will fail and which one will pass is often dauntingly difficult, even with experts. Variations of this include why me and not my competitor, why machine A and not B, why grade A and not B, and so on. Also, root cause analysis and similar programs seldom work well because there is no single root cause nor a single solution, and solutions may not resemble the cause. The good news, the great news is that troubleshooting does not necessarily require prediction. Also, troubleshooting of most common defects does not necessarily require any data collection, including raw material properties, machine settings and process data, test lab results, customer complaints, and so on. All you need for most common problems is get back to the basics. Go to school, read a book, view a YouTube clip, or do a literature search. Wouldn't it be a shame to struggle with wrinkles and not know or not bother to read chapters and two books on the subject? Wouldn't it be a shame to struggle with bagginess and not know or bother to view the two dozen YouTube clips on the subject? Wouldn't it be a shame to struggle with telescoping and not know that some telescopes are tight defects, others loose defects, and a few are taper defects, and have to do trial and error combinations of different winding curves. In short, a month in your plant is worth an hour in a library. Both are hard. Pick your hard. Thank you so very much for allowing me to share some insights on troubleshooting that I've learned in the more than four decades working in more than 1,000 plants. If you have any topics you would like to hear about, let me know in the comment section below. See you next time.